All right, good morning. Welcome to Palliative Care and Ger Geriatrics Grand Rounds. I'm B.R. Dobman, I'm the course director, and it's my privilege to welcome everyone today. Everyone here in the Ether Dome, at Dana-Farber, at Care Dimensions, and Cooley Dickinson Hospital, and to introduce our speaker this morning. Dr. Emily Rubin studied religious studies and bioethics at the University of Virginia and graduated from the University of Virginia School of Law. After practicing law for several years, she attended Dartmouth Medical School, where she was an active member of the Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical School Ethics Committee. She completed a combined residency in internal medicine and pediatrics here at MGH. She then completed a pulmonary and critical care fellowship at the University of Pennsylvania, where she also completed a master's of science in health policy research. She joined the faculty in the Division of Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine in February of 2017 and serves as a co-chair of the MGH Optimum Care Committee. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Rubin. Thank you, that's a very warm introduction. Can everybody hear? Um, thanks for coming. Um, so I think many of you have probably heard some version of this talk, but I'm giving a uh, hopefully slightly different one today. So I'm going to be talking about um, resolving conflicts over end of life treatment intensity. Thank you. Um, I have I have no disclosures. I was saying before this, at least I can see over the podium on this uh, on this one. That's unusual. Uh, so I have no disclosures. Um, so I'm going to start with a few cases. Um, the first case is a 65-year-old woman uh, with a severe brain injury after a fall. Her course at an outside hospital after her fall was complicated by ventriculitis with significant complications from that. And she was transferred to Mass General from an outside hospital after several weeks for consideration of neurosurgical intervention here. She received multiple interventions. Um, in the hopes that she would start to regain some level of consciousness. Five months after the initial injury, she is uh, vegetative and shows no signs of consciousness and is now dependent on a ventilator. Um, her family remains optimistic she'll have a meaningful recovery with time um, in light of um, evidence that a small number of people do emerge even after a prolonged period. Um, the patient had said shortly before the accident that she would not want to, quote, live as a vegetable, and the medical team believes that continued surgical intervention or other escalation of care would be inappropriate. Second case um, is a 57-year-old man with cutaneous T cell lymphoma who recently came to Mass General from his home in Florida to get medical care here, has family in the area. Um, he was hospitalized with sepsis and respiratory failure before he could get any treatment. Um, he was early in his course, intubated and started on continuous renal replacement therapy. He had extensive skin involvement requiring deep sedation to keep him comfortable. His only treatment option for the uh, T cell lymphoma was a stem cell transplant, which was thought to be no longer possible. And the family um, states that religious beliefs prevent them from stopping life support. And then in a case not from our hospital, I don't know how many of you have been following this case that's going on now, of a nine-year-old girl in the state of Texas who um, had a cardiac arrest um, that was thought secondary to a large tumor in her chest. Um, she was resuscitated and got a pulse back, um, but was not breathing, was put on a ventilator you know, in, in the emergency setting, and is thought to be brain dead. And following the first brain death evaluation, the family went to court to stop the hospital from doing a second evaluation, which is required to declare somebody legally brain dead. Um, and just yesterday, the court in Texas granted a stay for another week while the family tries to find a hospital that will accept her and transfer and um, treat her cancer. Um, so not a shortage of, these are just some a random assortment of cases, but I think we're all aware that these cases um, happen fairly frequently um, in our hospital. So the animating questions for this talk, um, and this is a question that I often get asked by teams, um, are we allowed to decline to provide or to discontinue life-sustaining medical interventions that we believe are not appropriate over the objection of the patient or a surrogate? And then a second important question is, um, even if we're technically allowed, whatever that means, um, should we, should we be doing this. So quick outline, so I'm going to give some context regarding conflicts over life-sustaining treatment, some brief historical perspective. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the current consensus critical care society guidelines on resolving intractable conflict on requests for potentially inappropriate treatment. I'll talk a little bit about our experience here and then talk about sort of lessons learned, questions going forward um, as we think about how we handle these kinds of cases. 
So first, um, just a couple of points of kind of context um, that I think are useful. Um, I don't know how many of you have seen this paper um, uh, that uh, Zier and Doug White published in the Annals of Internal Medicine in 2012, but I always like to show it because I think it's a good um, reminder of sort of the optimism gap that sometimes exists in the intensive care unit particularly. So this is, um, they took uh, a number of people who were acting as surrogates in the intensive care unit at the time the study was done, and they gave them, they asked them how they would interpret certain prognostic statements, and those are on the y-axis. So some of the statements were qualitative, um, he probably will not survive, some were quantitative, he has a 5% chance of surviving, and on the x-axis is how the surrogate interpreted that information um, in terms of a percentage chance of survival. So you can see the most dramatic cases on the bottom when they said, how would you interpret, he will definitely not survive. And the mean chance of survival that was assigned to that statement was between 25 and 30%. Um, and so this is um, a very dramatic demonstration of how people hear things differently from how we say them. Um, and whether that's because they don't trust what we're saying or because they have a need to be optimistic, which people do, um, we, don't, we don't know, but we do know that people hear statements very differently than we say them. Um, this is a slide from a paper that um, I published with colleagues in, the, in JAM Internal Medicine that's from a study we did when I was a fellow. And we, it was a very small part of a much larger study, but we asked um, uh, 200 patients who were hospitalized with serious um, either advanced malignancy, late stage heart failure, late stage lung disease, how they would rate various single element states of functional debility on a scale from much worse than death uh, sorry, worse than death to much better than death. Um, and again, these were single item health states like um, not able to get out of bed, confused all the time, need constant care. Um, and you can see that for many of these, um, a majority of patients rated them as either equal to or worse than death. I don't take these data um, literally by any means, but I think they're a demonstration of how, um, at least how people with serious illnesses anticipate that they would tolerate states of functional debility. And I think we do, we do a very poor job as a system of either evaluating um, the results of our interventions in terms of you know, how, how long people spend in these states. And then I think this is just one of a number of studies. Um, this is a study from Germany where they uh, did at 23 hospitals. They studied the perceptions by physicians and nurses and other staff in the intensive care units um, about how often um, non-beneficial treatment um, was happening. And they, they tried to correlate that with rates of burnout and intention to leave um, the job. And the most notable finding in this study, again, it's in Germany, 23 ICUs, was that um, perceived non-beneficial treatment of patients was highly associated with burnout and intention to leave the job, particularly in um, junior uh, physicians and in, and in nurses, not so much in senior physicians, but in, ju in junior physicians and ICU nurses. Um, so I think that's an important piece of background. So another important piece, and I'm not going to go into too much detail about this, but in almost all of these cases, um, one of the things that comes up is our prognostic accuracy and how, how you know, how clearly do we know, how certain are we? And I would say the summary of our ability to prognosticate is that it's not great, but that there are some signals that where there's broad consensus among multidisciplinary professionals and multiple of those, um, that, that it's better. But so these are just a couple of studies. Um, Meadow has done a lot of the research on prognostic accuracy. And in 2014, he published a study of 6,000 prognostic predictions for almost, uh, for over 2,000 medical ICU patients. Um, there was a high degree of discordance between providers. The predictions of death prior to discharge were correct only 56% of the time. Um, although of the patients who were predicted by at least two people, two healthcare professionals to die in house, 93% of those patients died within six months of discharge and only 4% were functioning with a Barthel score of greater than 70 at six months. So while we're not great at the specifics where there is um, agreement or not terrible at predicting sort of mid-range outcomes. Um, in this study that was a little bit earlier, of more than 2,000 patients who were expected to die in the hospital, 50% survived. Um, in this study, again, predictions corroborated by multiple providers were more accurate, but 15% of those predicted by all caretakers to die survived to discharge. This study did not look at sort of longer-term outcomes and how people were functioning, but our predictions of in-hospital mortality are suboptimal.
Um, this is actually a study that some um, colleagues at Penn did where they, um, it, it was a very well done study. They asked within, uh, at about, for patients who had been in the ICU, medical ICU for about three days, they asked physicians and nurses about um, how likely they thought it was um, that the patient would die in the hospital, that they would die within six months. And they asked about very specific functional outcomes at six months. And they also, they, they were asked yes, no to the mortality questions and to the functional outcome. These were things like, we'll be able to walk up 10 steps, we'll be able to toilet independently, we'll be able to make some basic decisions. They were very specific yes, no. And they also assessed the degree of confidence. And so for um, 22 to 33 percent of predictions, both physicians and the physicians and nurses said the same thing and were highly confident. And for those for those predictions, the discriminative accuracy was was very good. Um, so here, for six month mortality, for example, the positive likelihood ratio um, was over 40, where the physician and nurse agreed and they were highly confident. So I think this is where um, you know where there's very broad consensus with a high degree of confidence about outcomes. We are better, but by no means perfect. Um, so now I'm just gonna go do a little bit of brief historical perspective about um, sort of disputes about life-sustaining treatment. Some of this will undoubtedly be familiar to many of you, but just as a quick review. So the first cases um, that really brought these things to public attention were um, the Karen Ann Quinlan case and the Nancy Cruzon case. And uh, Karen Ann Quinlan was a young woman who was vegetative after a cardiac arrest um, in the 70s um, and um, her, parents wanted to take her off of a ventilator. And at the time, the medical team was um, fighting against that. So this, the issue in the Karen Ann Quinlan case was whether a patient through a surrogate has the right to um, stop life-sustaining treatment. And the New Jersey Supreme Court, um, in the first case of its kind, really, in this country, said that there was a right to privacy that protected the right to make a decision via a surrogate to terminate life-sustaining treatment. She was taken off the ventilator um, and um, actually survived for quite a long time before she died. Um, and then in th this same concept went to the United States Supreme Court in 1990. Um, Nancy Cruzon was likewise um, profoundly neurologically impaired and the family in this case wanted to stop um, artificial nutrition and hydration. And the Supreme Court affirmed that there's a right to privacy that protects that decision, but the state of Missouri had imposed um, a requirement that her wishes be established by clear and convincing evidence and had said that she had, there was not clear and convincing evidence that she would wish to have tube feed stopped. Um, so the Supreme Court, while it said there is this right to privacy, um, also said that states can require a high degree of evidence. Um, and so in that case, they ended up coming up with some other statements and she was allowed to, you know, the tube feeds were allowed to stop and she also died. But there are many states uh, even now that have, particularly for nutrition and hydration, have a different standard. So in the state of New Hampshire, for example, you can't stop tube feeds um, in a patient, uh, a surrogate can't stop tube feeds unless there's a written advance directive by the person saying that they would wish for them to be stopped. Whether it happens or not um, is a different question, but under the law, there are several states where that's true even today. So these were the early cases and they were about um, the rights of patients to say they wanted things stopped. Um, and these are sort of some quotes from the uh, Supreme Court decision in the Cruzon case that I think sort of presage some things about where we are today. So this is um, the chief uh, justice in the majority opinion said, we believe that Missouri may permissibly place an increased risk of an erroneous decision on those seeking to terminate an incompetent individual's life-sustaining treatment. An erroneous decision not to terminate results in a maintenance of the status quo. The possibility of subsequent developments such as advancements in medical science, the discovery of new evidence regarding the patient's intent, changes in the law, or simply the unexpected death of the patient despite the administration of life-sustaining treatment at least create the potential that a wrong decision will eventually be corrected or its impact mitigated. An erroneous decision to withdraw life-sustaining treatment, however, is not susceptible of correction. So this is sort of a version of the argument, or not the argument, but the sort of position that many will take. We don't, we're not good at, progno we're not good at prognosticating, things could change, this is a permanent decision, you know, we should really err on the side of caution. Um, Justice Brennan, in the dissenting opinion, um, said sort of the, you know, sort of posited the other side of, of this. The majority claims the allocation of the risk of error is justified because it's more important not to terminate life support for someone who would wish it continued than to honor the wishes of someone who would not. An erroneous decision to terminate life support is irrevocable, while an erroneous decision not to terminate, quote, results in the maintenance of the status quo. But from the point of view of the patient, an erroneous decision in either direction is irrevocable. An erroneous decision to terminate artificial nutrition and hydration, to be sure, will lead to the failure of that last remnant of physiologic life, the brainstem, and result in complete brain death. An erroneous 
ALJ's decision not to terminate life support, however, robs the patient of the very qualities protected by the right to avoid unwanted medical treatment. His own degraded existence is perpetuated. His family's suffering is protracted. The memory he leaves behind becomes more and more distorted. So this is, you know, now, how long ago? 30-ish uh, years ago. And I think these, um, this is kind of the, you know, debate that we have um, now ongoing is sort of which way do we err in these cases. So after these, um, in, in the sort of the setting of these cases, there was an increasing focus on advanced directives as a way to assert your right to privacy to decline medical interventions. And in 1990, the Patient Self-Determination Act was passed, and that's part of what requires us to ask people if they have advanced directives. Um, but in the subsequent years, as I think you all know, the attention started to shift um, away from the right of the patient to decline unwanted treatment to the right of patients or their surrogates to demand any life-sustaining treatment. And everyone sort of began to try to address the ethical and legal consequences of this and to try to um, figure out how do we deal with these requests for treatments believed to be quote unquote medically futile. Um, and then there ensued a long debate about terminology and people tried to define what is futile, what's not, how do we develop policies to address it. And there was a big academic debate about whether the term futility could be meaningfully defined. Um, Lawrence Schneiderman proposed a definition of quantitative and qualitative futility with quantitative being this intervention has not worked in the last X number of people who have received it, et cetera. And there was a lot of effort to try to define this. Ultimately, sort of culminating in the acknowledgement that it can't really be defined. It's sort of a circular, you know, with, 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 with the exception of things that are physiologically unable to achieve the effect that's intended. Futility is sort of an argument that can go around and around. Um, and really what we're talking about is um, conflict over what's appropriate. Um, and so ultimately, I think the futility movement sort of died under its own weight with the concept that it's just too subjective to, me to be meaningfully defined, that what constitutes a benefit entirely depends on who's assessing what a benefit is. And there was a lot of concern that this notion of, of declaring things medically futile um, favors the value judgment of physicians over those of patients and their families, and that physicians, while they have expertise in medicine, don't necessarily have generalized expertise that allows them to sort of say what is and is not a benefit, what is and is not a dignified death. So at this time, there was sort of a movement away from trying to define futility and towards the idea of, you know, we disagree about what's appropriate, how do we develop a fair process to resolve disputes like that? And so in 1999, Texas, where this case of Peyton Summons is playing out, the one I referred to at the beginning, um, was the first and only state to have a legislative act to address these things. And they lay out a process where an, an institutional committee um, hears the case and, um, and um, hears everyone's perspectives, makes a ruling, gives the family an opportunity to try to transfer the patient um, to try to appeal to a court. And then if all of those things are exhausted and the patient can't be transferred and the court has not um, overruled the decision of the hospital, then life, su life support can be, um, can be terminated. There have been several cases that have gone through that process in Texas, and there's ongoing concern that um, you know, these policies are applied um, more often to patients and families who are um, ethnic and racial minorities and who are socioeconomically disadvantaged, um, which is, is a part of the concern about these, about these things that I'll get to later. So um, in the 2000s, there was a continued move towards this idea of a process-based approach with a focus on getting second opinions, getting expert help, mediating these things. And then in 2015, a number of um, critical care societies, including the American Thoracic Society, the American Association of Critical Care Nurses, the European Society of Intensive Care Medicine um, put out joint guidelines um, that sort of lay out a process um, for resolving disputes about what they call requests for potentially inappropriate treatment. So um, I'm just going to talk about the guidelines a little bit, um, and then I'll get to sort of our experience here. So these guidelines sort of lay out a taxonomy of conflict, and they address each sort of category of conflict in a slightly different way. So um, at one end, medically futile, and I'll talk about what that means, and at the other end is potentially inappropriate, request for potentially inappropriate treatment, where the request is not strictly 
um, time where, where the, the issue isn't strictly time limited. And I would say most of our cases sort of fall into that category. And as you go from one end to the other, they say there's sort of more of a need for third party involvement and consensus and less clinician discretion, single clinician discretion. So medically futile is described, is defined under these guidelines as some as interventions that are literally um, unable to achieve the physiologic um, effect. So um, things like performing CPR in a patient who has aortic stenosis where the valve is so small that compressions won't work to circulate blood through the body. So things that literally will not work. In that case, everyone agrees there's no obligation to offer those things. You should explain the rationale and offer high quality palliative care. The offer high quality palliative care is always, a, always part of the recommendation. Um, the second category is things that are legally discretionary. I'm not gonna get into this except to say in certain states, there are pieces of legislation that sort of carve out, there's no, like in Oklahoma, there's a statute that says that you don't need to do CPR on an imminently dying patient. Um, there are very few of these and how exactly these would apply is, is not always clear, but it doesn't really apply to us in Massachusetts. So in those cases, um, if it's truly thought to be legally discretionary, um, you're not obligated to provide it. And then the next category is requests for things that the team feels are potentially inappropriate, um, but there's, that they're not time limited. So this is, um, these are treatments that at least have a chance of achieving the effect that the patient or surrogate wants to accomplish, even if that effect is you know, keeping somebody alive longer in an ICU, um, but that health professionals believe provide more harm than benefit and should be withheld or stopped on ethical grounds. Um, so this would be, for example, you have a stable patient who has um, chronic respiratory failure thought to be secondary to metastatic lung cancer. The patient's stable, it's not an emergency, um, but there are no treatment options and the medical team feels like performing a tracheostomy is not appropriate. Um, initiating dialysis in a patient with chronic kidney disease who's minimally conscious. Um, things like this where it's not an emergency, but um, people think it's inappropriate. So this is where they lay out a conflict resolution process, um, which includes um, expert consultation to continue the negotiation. All of these things sort of assume that these things have been discussed and mediated. And as we all know, this sort of long process, the multiple meetings, um, which I'll get to later. But all of these things assume that there has been a antecedent um, process to try to mediate these without resort to this kind of process. And then you ultimately, when this is deemed to be intractable, you give notice of the process to the surrogate obtain a second medical opinion, obtain a review by an interdisciplinary hospital committee, offer surrogates the opportunity to transfer, inform them of the opportunity to pursue what's called extramural appeal. Um, for all intents and purposes, extramural appeal means appeal to a court because we don't have bodies in this country that are sort of non extrajudicial bodies that would hear cases like this. In Canada, they, they do in certain, in Ontario, they have um, a sort of body that hears these cases, but we don't. Um, and I don't think there's any appetite to have bodies like that based on the uh, 2009 response to the, the death panel response. Um, but, and then, um, after all of that, implement the decision of the resolution process. Um, so this is kind of similar to what I was describing the Texas Advanced Directives Act. It lays out um, a process that is thought to be that is thought to be a fair process of hearing all points of view. Um, and then the last category is potentially inappropriate and time limited. I think there's a little bit of sort of how time limited things are um, does become an issue in these cases because um, this, as I'll get to that process of going through something like this is very laborious and time consuming. So even if something strictly speaking is not urgent, um, there are cases in which really it's prohibitive to go through this process. So potentially inappropriate and time limited would be again, the team feels um, that it's inappropriate, but it's physiologically possible to achieve what the family or, sir, or patient wants to achieve. This would be, um, although I would argue that here, it's actually physically not necessarily possible. But the example they give is performing CPR for a patient in multi-organ failure on multiple vasopressors. So here, the family is saying, we want you to do this. The team is saying no. And so here, they recommend completing as much of this process as possible, at a minimum, obtaining a second clinical opinion that the requested treatment is, quote, outside the bounds of accepted clinical practice. And I think one of the problems that we have, and I'll talk about this later, is I don't know what this means now, what's outside the bounds of accepted clinical practice, because so many things sort of happen routinely that I think all of us would agree should not be within the bounds of accepted clinical practice. But I think we've created a situation in which it can be hard to argue that something is outside the bounds of accepted clinical practice. Um, again, always explain the rationale and offer high quality palliative care.
Um, so just a little bit about our experience here responding to these kinds of requests. Um, so um, Mass General has had a policy like this for a number of years, uh, pre predating by many years these consensus guidelines. Um, it was developed in 2005 during a prolonged disagreement over life sustaining treatment for a patient with ALS. It was, um, you know, reviewed and vetted through hospital um, administration and then approved and it's it was reviewed as part of a legal case um, and then remains subject to sort of ongoing schedule reviews and it's similar to what I've talked about um, the guiding principles of the of the policy are that the process should be invoked only when standard measures have been unsuccessful um, that a quorum of the hospital ethics committee should be involved including at least one community representative and no hospital administrators or lawyers there's dispute um, and people can disagree about sort of whether hospital administration and lawyers should be included in these things but here we do not believe that they should um, and that the protocol should cover should sort of be equally balanced so it should cover both a physician saying uh, and a medical team saying we don't think this is appropriate to continue and a patient saying we don't think this is appropriate to continue in reality um, it's always been the former um, we very rarely have cases where um, I think we have cases where the team feels that um, a family or a patient is sort of um, uh, pulling back uh, too soon for people's comfort, but we have not had any cases where they feel strongly enough about that to kind of get to this, the point of going through a process like this. So the process, again, very similar. Um, a quorum of the a committee meets with the healthcare team to hear the medical perspective, meets with the patient or the surrogate and any people they wanna bring with them to hear their perspective, and then meet as a group to reach a consensus about the request um, uh, to withhold or withdraw life-sustaining treatment. And then if the recommendation is to do that, the decision is sent to the chief medical officer and the general counsel's office, um, and then the patient or family is notified um, in writing of the decision. They do have to be given sufficient opportunity to seek transfer, um, legal advice, and judicial involvement. Um, and that's defined in our policy as three business days, which is a relatively short period of time, but there is flexibility in how we address that. And then if those things don't happen, um, life-sustaining treatment is withdrawn. So in all of this time, there have only been 10 cases that have gone through this um, policy, all involving um, uh, physicians and teams who wanted to limit an intervention, as I said. The age range of the patients has been from 48 to 85, with seven of them over the age of 70. Prior to admission, four were completely independent, four completely dependent, and two partially dependent. And at the time of the consult, four were full, uh, sorry, four were, were full code, five were do not resuscitate, but were receiving some form of life-sustaining treatment, and one was DNR, DNI, but was receiving peritoneal dialysis, and the request was for no escalation, no ICU transfer. Um, and then eight of them were receiving some form of life-sustaining treatment at the time of the um, resolving conflicts policy, and most were on multiple forms of life support. So the requests that were being made by the medical team ranged from changing the code status to discontinuing dialysis, a ventilator, pressors, and uh, medical nutrition and hydration. In nine cases, the committee supported the requesting limitations, and in one case, the process was curtailed because of a legal appeal. So in all, in all of the cases, there were three legal appeals. In one, the court said the, the issue was withholding dialysis and the court said that was okay. The patient was subsequently transferred, um, arrested, had CPR and died in that setting. In another, the court granted an injunction requiring the patient to remain full code. Um, and then the patient regained capacity and asked that um, everything be stopped. Um, and then it, in the last one, in the most recent case, the the family was going to court to try to get an injunction and um, the day before the court appearance was scheduled the patient died on the ventilator um, after developing a fatal arrhythmia and was not resuscitated which was unfortunate uh, in terms of the family's perception of what happened um, so in the summary of the outcomes of these cases so in three cases life support was actually withdrawn over the objection of the surrogate in three the patient was permitted to die without initiation of life-sustaining therapy over the objection of the surrogate. In one, as I mentioned, the patient was transferred. One woke up and asked for things to be stopped. In one case, um, the attending physician did not feel comfortable implementing the recommendations because of a difficult family dynamic. Um, and um, in one, uh, the patient died on the ventilator while awaiting a court date. So these cases are extraordinarily time consuming. This is. Um, um, this is a table that shows kind of the average, the average and median times um, of, of each step of the process. And you can see in blue the total time from 
the ethics consult to the limitation of life sustaining treatment was a median of 20 days. And so um, in many of these cases that do not involve you know, for example, the, the um, precipitant case of all of this, the ALS case, that was a case that was going to go on and on. In many of these cases, patients are sick enough that they will die at some point, notwithstanding what we're doing. Um, and so 43% of patients died or transferred um, during the process. So I would say that, um, you know, we often have cases that um, where we think is this something that should go through this policy, but it's very rarely implemented and for a variety of reasons. One is that it's, um, it's very hard to implement it. It's logistically challenging. It's emotionally cumbersome. It is very frequently easier in many ways to, um, especially where somebody, we think somebody is going to inevitably die, notwithstanding what we're doing, to sort of let the situation play out. I think um, there's also a legitimate desire to accommodate surrogates. There's a concern that, engaging in this pro kind of process will potentially complicate grief or will somehow make this worse for the family members who have to live with this event um, uh, going forward. There's also, as I alluded to, a very narrow window. So um, you really have to start this process, in my view, kind of immediately upon recognition that this conflict is not gonna resolve um, because it sort of rapidly becomes, becomes too late. Um, and there's also a very significant, I think one of the biggest barriers um, in communication in general in these cases, but um, in a process like this in particular is that teams switch so often that um, to ask somebody who's just come onto service and has just met the family to sort of assume this process already underway is very hard. And people also have legitimate differences of opinion about whether it's right to engage in this kind of process, whether the prognosis is really that poor. It's just, it's very difficult when teams transition so frequently to kind of have everybody on board for something that feels um, significant and sometimes feels confrontational, even though it is, you know, not intended to be. So I think that's a very, um, a very difficult um, aspect of it. People always, not always, people often ask me sort of what's the difference? Why can't we say no to these things? Surgeons say no all the time. And I think um, one of the big differences is that when people are asking about a surgery and surgeons are saying, you know, the risk benefit um, isn't favorable and if I'm not willing to do the surgery, it's an individual saying, I'm not willing to do this thing right now. For us in medicine, it's, you know, if I say, it, ha it really has to be a consensus because there are so many people involved in the decision that the logistics of how we deliver things like mechanical ventilation or dialysis or other things are very different. If there were one person who were in charge of somebody's care for the whole duration of these things, it may feel very different, but there's not. Um, so in terms of code status disputes, um, because of the, the sort of um, way the resolving conflict process works and the fact that it often involves very entrenched conflict um, and many patients died during implementation of the procedure. There's a separate policy that was implemented in 2007 that deals with um, situations in which um, uh, teams feel that offering uh, CPR uh, would not be appropriate. And so that, I think most of you are familiar with this, there's a life-sustaining treatment policy in section 3.6 sort of provides two situations in which um, medical teams um, and the attending physician in, in particular can sort of decline to offer uh, CPR. So the situation one is the imminently dying patient, the responsible physician should consider protecting a patient who is imminently dying from CPR's potential harms by not offering CPR and entering the appropriate orders. Um, in this situation, the responsible physician may decide but it's not required to obtain a second opinion um, from another uh, senior or experienced physician or from the optimum care committee and also may request advice from the Office of the General Counsel. So this is really, these are subjective by nature, right, imminently dying. You could go around and around about what that means, but this is meant to, somebody is dying of an underlying process that cannot be reversed and uh, CPR is not going to help. Um, the second one is um, the responsible physician. Situation two is the patient who's not thought to be imminently dying, but is perceived to have no reasonable chance of surviving CPR to the point of leaving the hospital. Again, subjective. Um, but um, in this case, if after careful discussion, um, the patient or surrogate does not assent to the plan, orders to withhold CPR should be entered only if another experienced physician and a consultant from the OCC concur, and only if it's been documented in the medical record. And I would say, as I think we all know, what happens in most of these cases is that people do ultimately assent 
um, to the plan. Um, but there are cases in which um, uh, that doesn't happen and we do invoke these, um, these policies. So in either circumstances, you need to inform the patient or surrogate of the decision, why it's being made, and assure that the patient will continue to receive um, the highest possible quality of care. So these policies, um, they're often called unilateral DNR policies. Um, we sort of try to avoid that language because we feel like it's, um, it's inflammatory, but these policies where medical professionals are allowed to decline to offer these interventions um, have raised, as I mentioned before, sort of concerns about um, being overly paternalistic, the possibility of disproportional use in vulnerable populations. Um, there are sort of an indefinite number of cases around the hospital, I think we could agree, where um, we think it's very unlikely that patients would benefit from, um, from CPR, and yet we don't always invoke these policies. Um, so um, some colleagues here reviewed and published our experience with this policy from 2007 to 2013 in the Journal of Critical Care, and they found that neither age nor race was associated with the recommendation not to offer CPR, uh, but premorbid functional status and severity of illness were. I will point out that the um, that race um, is associated with um, having an ethics consult to begin with, but it was not associated with the decision to recommend not to offer CPR. So in that um, period, 2017, 2007 to 2013, there were 134 conflicts over code status that were brought through this process. 89 did not resolve with ethics consultation. Um, withholding was recommended in 67 of them and a DNR was ordered in 61. And of those cases, um, there have been no, uh, to date, no lawsuits after the fact over um, the, you know, declining to resuscitate. Um, and this is, so Ellen Robinson and Cornelia Kremens and um, others um, published this in the Hastings Center's report. They looked at the sort of mo most family members, it's almost universally family members who we're dealing with, after a DNR order is implemented, will sort of, uh, uh, adjust to that or sort of not continue to persist in insisting on intervention. Um, and they looked at the group of surrogates who persist in requesting it even after the sort of team and hospital have said this is not something that would be done. Um, and they looked at sort of the characteristics of those surrogates. And I think as many people in the room can relate to, they often make arguments. What they found in terms of themes was that these people often make arguments about death and dying that are at odds with how death often happens in the ICU. So they'll say things like, if it happens naturally, that's okay. I think many of us have seen um, family, you know, as recently as yesterday, I, you know, a family with every machine in the room and, you know, we just want them to, you know, if, it, if, if it's God's will or if it happens naturally, it's okay. And there's literally every type of life. I've had people say that when patients are on ECMO. So there's this sort of real disconnect in some of these cases um, between their perception of something happening naturally and what's actually happening in the room. Um, religion and spirituality was a factor in some, but by no means all of the cases. And one of the things that um, came out that I think, um, is also very relatable to a lot of people here is that they don't necessarily see their role as offering sort of substituted judgment as saying what would this person want if they could speak for themselves. They see they, the themes that kind of come out as not wanting to be responsible for the patient's death, um, maintaining the life of the person that they love and being an advocate, a very strong advocate for that um, person. And a disproportionate number of these patients were children, adult children of um, parents who were the patient who had sort of given up um, their jobs, moved in, sort of devoted their life entirely to caring for um, their parent. Um, so now I just want to talk a little bit about um, sort of how do we think about these things, what have we learned from these experiences and from sort of our efforts to mediate these conflicts in general and sort of questions going forward and then I would love to sort of open it up. Oh good, we've got plenty of time. Okay, so I think some lessons. I think m most of us know this, but these cases bring into very clear relief, I think, the false equivalency between withholding and withdrawing life-sustaining treatment. So, you know, in ethics textbooks and what they teach you is that these are no different ethically, and I, I, I think, strictly speaking, that may, that may be true. But um, realistically, logistically, emotionally, they're extremely different. So I think there are many cases in which, I think there are many, many cases in which people get intubated in an emergency and in 24 hours you're reevaluating and it works out fine. And then there are cases where I think it's predictable that once a breathing tube gets put in, you're in a much going to be in a much different um, situation. And so I think the perception, um, rightly in some ways by families um, and sometimes medical professionals, but uh, certainly families, is that stopping things once started is in a very different category than never starting them to begin with. 
um, I think um, the idea of sort of the way we have these conversations um, uh, being counterproductive is brought into very clear relief in a lot of these cases. Um, so by the time cases get even to ethics consultation, let alone to sort of the point of seeming intractable, um, they have almost always been preceded by um, dozens of conversations in which people have been uh, given a choice, but then sort of repeatedly you know, dissuaded from making the choice they're making. And I think it sets up a dynamic that makes resolution of these things extremely difficult. Um, so um, that is you know, something that we all need to figure out a different answer to. Um, and then the why me, I, I don't know, for lack of a better word, I, I'm calling this the why me, why now phenomenon. And what I mean by this is not, not for patients and families, but for providers, um, there is a real, um, this is kind of a version of a sunk cost bias where, um, when you go to try to draw a line and you're talking to you know a medical team about for example a patient who's had a tracheostomy and is generally sort of not recovering and then the kidneys fail and the question is whether you start dialysis and there's a real and in some cases legitimate um discussion about well why should i now you know this why did why was the person trached and um, in the first place, if we we're saying it's not appropriate to do these things, why should we be drawing the line of dialysis? Sort of, there really is this, the, the further back, um, uh, the, the more things that are done, the more it becomes seemingly arbitrary to draw a line at the next thing. And I think that is, that is a real phenomenon that we see very frequently, um, that it makes it more important to consider, for example, at the point of tracheostomy, um, because once somebody receives a tracheostomy, they're really, for example, I'm just using that as an example, there really is this sense that sort of, how do I now, as a person in charge of this patient's care, say, well, but this is really, we've now really reached the ceiling. It does become harder to say that something's inappropriate when it's been preceded by a vast number of other things that were arguably inappropriate. Um, again, a very narrow time window for invoking this kind of policy. Um, it always kind of seems early until it's too late. And then, as I said, team transitions are a very significant um, challenge and often a barrier to sort of um, implementing a policy like this. Um, I think in terms of legal, you know, that's a whole separate talk, but I think it's very fair to say that courts are reluctant to approve actions that will lead to immediate death. So the case in Texas um, is an example of this. Once these things get to a court, a court is almost uniformly, um, when somebody is on life support, is, a court is almost uniformly going to delay at least for a period of time to get all the evidence and hear everything. It's going to be very rare for a court to just say, okay, we agree this sounds inappropriate. Um, and so, you know, this is one of the many reasons that, that the legal system system is not a very good venue for resolving these kinds of disputes. That said, um, I think one of the concerns that people have about sort of are we allowed to do this is, you know, am I going, I don't think this is by any means the entire story, but, but people are legitimately concerned about can I get sued? Am I going to, you know, um, expose myself to, you know, a nightmare of a lawsuit if I do this thing and the family's jumping up and down and saying you can't do it? Um, I think families, the, the reality is anybody can sue for these things and they might, um, but it's also true that I think families are very unlikely to sue after the fact and there are very few cases. They come up, but there are very few cases where um, somebody is clearly um, sort of the broad consensus is that somebody is going to die and the team stops life-sustaining treatment and after the fact, the family sues. It's still a real concern whether it's rare or not, but um, it is rare. So in terms of questions going forward, and these are sort of my questions, and I would love to hear people's thoughts about them, but I think one of the question is, um, is sort of does the balance of harms and benefits really justify kind of taking a stand in these cases? So this is a uh, New England Journal perspectives piece that Bob Trug, who's a pediatric intensivist, wrote um, in 2010, where he talked about um, resuscitating a small child um, who clearly was not going to survive a resuscitation, but um, talking about how sort of doing that for the sake of the family, he felt in that case was the right thing to do, and that it's not always wrong to do these things when there's some, you know, benefit to a family of seeing that everything is done. I think, um, and I think we have to think really carefully about those kinds of arguments. I think they resonate in some ways, but in many of our cases, it's not just 10 minutes of CPR, it's very, very prolonged intervention that people feel is inappropriate. And so I think there are arguments to be made in the context of individual things, um, but it is harder to sort of make that argument, I think, in the setting of many of our cases. Um, so this is just sort of a point counterpoint of, you know, sort of the, the 
in favor and against. So, you know, in favor is maintaining patient dignity, preventing suffering. On the other side is sort of who are we to say what's dignified or what's suffering. And we can generally keep patients sedated and comfortable. So sort of, you know, what are we most worried about here? Um, I think maintaining professional integrity and avoiding burnout is a big one. Um, on the other hand, these cases, although they loom large in people's minds, are a relatively small number of cases overall. And we should find ways to sort of support each other to prevent burnout. And really, this isn't about us. And we should um, you know, sort of just deal with it differently. Um, in use of resources is a whole separate argument. But um, against that is that, on the whole, these cases account for a relatively small amount of resources. Maybe we're harming families by prolonging death and sort of putting them through this. Maybe we're harming them by leaving them with the impression that people have been abandoned or that everything hasn't been done. Um, and then in terms of prognostic accuracy, again, there is some evidence that with broad consensus and a high degree of confidence, we actually are, are pretty good at prognosis, but we're not, we're not ideal. So um, I think that, um, I don't know if everybody's familiar with the tragedy of the commons, which is sort of individual people using up resources that um, end up causing harm to the whole. It's not a perfect sort of analogy, but I do think that these cases have a broader, um, the way we deal with these individual cases do have broader implications for our community and for healthcare in general and how we deliver it. So burnout obviously is one issue, but then I think the idea that, um, you know, sort of if we allow these things to play themselves out um, and have an increasing amount of um, care that people perceive as non beneficial that's going on, I think two things can happen. Um, one is that, um, is what I'm calling futility creep where, um, people, particularly I think, who are training or more juniors start to feel like everything is, uh, is futile, for lack of a better word. So when all I have is a hammer, you know, um, everything's a nail. And then on the, the converse is that um, people can, I think, start to not be able to distinguish, um, can, can not be able to not recognize the things that actually are not beneficial. So you can either sort of start to see everything is futile or nothing is futile. And I think in general, those things have implications for how other patients get treated that we can't really quantify. But I think that that is true. So that the way we deal with these individual extreme cases do have sort of implications for the care of other patients that may be problematic, which is a reason to try to address these. Um, so I think other questions going forward, I think it seems in large measure um, arbitrary which of these cases would go through a process like this. Um, it depends on um, who happens to be on service, how strongly they feel about it. Um, in some measure, I'm sure it depends on the demeanor of the family um, and lots of subjective things that um, are hard to quantify. But is that a problem or is that not a problem? Um, the fact that in our cases, and I think in most cases, the committee within the hospital supports the medical team. Um, is that actual bias that we need to be concerned about? Or is that selection bias? Meaning, um, are these cases so far at an extreme by the time they get to this point that you can really say that reasonable people wouldn't disagree about what's appropriate? Um, and then a big question, I think, is how we should think about the timing and appropriateness of, um, of hospital transfer. So in all of these policies, um, there's a notion that people should be given time to transfer the patient to an outside hospital. Um, I think this is a very, um, I have very mixed feelings about this because in many ways I feel like if we have collectively as a community determined that this care is inappropriate to try to help facilitate transfer to another hospital feels in some cases to be wrong um, for a variety of reasons. On the other hand, the other, you know, on the flip side, Maybe we should be as a hospital sort of saying, this is how we do things here. And there are things that we simply don't think, you know, will be helpful. And so earlier on saying, you know, we can help you try to find someplace um, else that would do this, but this is how we do it here. Um, and I think um, there are arguments to be made for both, but the reality is that both in these policies and also on, under Massachusetts law, there are references to sort of helping facilitate transfer where, where people at your hospital are not willing to do certain things. So I think that's a, how we deal with that um, and when we when we sort of discuss that um, is very variable now and probably should be something that we um, sort of formalize more. And then, as I alluded to before, sort of what is now outside the bounds of accepted clinical practice. So I would say the first case where somebody is dying of cancer with no treatment options and is on multiple forms of life support and in, you know, excruciating pain from diffuse skin involvement, um, that should be outside the bounds of accepted clinical practice to keep that person on life support in an ICU. I think, you know, are there things that we can all agree on? But 
I don't know. I mean, those things happen now. So how do you sort of say that something's outside of the bounds? Um, stopping CVVH when a patient will never be able to tolerate hemodialysis. Is that, you know, outside, is, is continuing CVVH kind of indefinitely because a family wants it continued? Is that now inside the bounds or outside the bounds? And ECMO is sort of as a special case, but stopping ECMO is that, um, you know, should, should we be carving out certain things and just saying these are so far outside that we're not going to do these? Um, and I think one of the concerns about having a process like this is that um, it can have, I think, a sort of perverse um, effect of making people feel like they can't draw lines without resort to a process. If you have a process that says this is how we deal with intractable conflict, then it, does it sort of obviate common sense, you know, and, and discourage people from just saying, no, this is clearly not right and we're not doing it. And I think in my experience here, there are plenty of cases where we still say this is clearly not right and we're not doing it. Um, including this, the case of the guy with cancer in the ICU. But you do have to think about, you know, we have this policy, and if you have a policy and then don't follow it in certain cases, you know, what implications does that have? And then to put things a little bit in palliative care terminology, so, so what can we do about this? So I love talking about talking about it, um, but I think, and I think this is one of the things that is actually really important in trying to avert these conflicts. So I think in many cases, by the time we get involved, you know, the die has been cast in these repetitive conversations where people are presented with a choice. And then we know from, you know, from many things, but from prospect theory uh, in the most sort of mathematical way that um, losses feel worse to people. So when you are now taking away um, a choice that people thought they had, you know, five days ago, it feels very different. And so I think we need to figure out um, a way when we're, if we're going to be putting these choices about CPR and intubation and other things to people, we need to find a way to much more clearly signpost that, especially, you know, with serious Ill, seriously ill patients, we want to make sure we're not doing things that are inconsistent with your wishes. There may come a time that these things would not you know, help you and, and the medical team will come back to you and talk to you about this. So we, we don't, I don't think we do, not people in this room, but in general as a system, we don't do a good job. We sort of create the impression that this will ad infinitum be a choice. And so I think that's a big problem. On the bottom, I just have the Starling curve, which shows um, the, you know, cardiac output response to, to preload. And I think um, this is the same thing in my mind with these conversations that people have is that you get to a very uh, decreasing, a diminishing return um, with these constant conversations about, about, um, about code status in particular. And then another uh, palliative care term that I think is important here is naming the dilemma. So I think, um, again, it's taken as a given that extensive mediation should happen before we invoke this process. And I think sometimes we over negotiate these things um, because we know that repeated attempts to convince people um, can be counterproductive. So should we be the flip side of maybe we should never be doing this is maybe we should be doing this much more often and sort of when we see that this is going to be a conflict, maybe we should be naming that much sooner and preemptively sort of saying sometimes we disagree and we have a process and maybe make the process less onerous and sort of make it less of a big deal to just name a dilemma and resolve it earlier so that it doesn't become this, you know, big, huge, drawn out thing um, and just normalizing it a little bit more. Um, so that's just, you know something I think about. All right, and then what else can we do? And I think the things that are being done largely by you know, people in this room in terms of improving discussion and documentation of preferences in patients with serious illnesses um, will go a long way. Um, but I think the, the piece where when the rubber hits the road, people say, you know, we understand what was important and these things are not going to help you accomplish. I mean, I think it, without the, the latter piece where people are willing to say, we're not doing these things because they're inconsistent with, you know, what's important um, is a big piece of it that, that we need to be working on. And then um, this is just a quote from those consensus guidelines that says, um, the medical profession should lead public engagement efforts and advocate for policies and legislation about when life prolonging technologies should not be used. Um, I gave a talk the other day to a bunch of um, healthcare professionals from the Netherlands um, about, and we talked about sort of differences in international, you know, ICU utilization and end of life. And um, one of them asked, well, what are, you know, our doctors here and nurses and other people who are involved, like politically engaged in this issue? Um, and I had just actually at the dog park that morning been talking to somebody about how there was a, a some study that showed that doctors are the least likely to engage in extramural sort of community service. And I thought, 
God, I'm embarrassed to say, I feel like I should be like, you know, at the head of the line for advocating for policies and legislation in this regard. Um, but you know, I don't think we do do a very good job sort of in the public arena of, um, of doing this. So that's another thing to, to think about. All right, that's it. Questions, thoughts? Thank you, Emmy. That was wonderful. I'll, I'll open up the questions by asking. I'm curious about those cases where a request for hospital transfer does occur. And I'm wondering, in your role as an ethicist and as an intensivist, if you're ever involved in those decision making of will we accept this patient where a conflict has been unresolved so far? Oh, you mean, so, so it's a, yeah. So um, on, I think what my experience with it in terms of our offering transfer is that it often happens quite late um, and that what people will, will do is say, well, we're going to tell the family they can try to transfer them. They, they can try to find somebody to transfer. And what I've always said there is, look, if we're going to sort of bring up transfer, it has to be a meaningful thing. A family cannot access and it, you know, a, a, a triage person for an outside ICU. I mean, it's sort of ridiculous. So while I think people are like, I'm not gonna, a lot of people will say, I don't feel right about talking to other hospitals, but they can try to do it if they want. And what my view on that from an ethical standpoint is, is either we should be saying, we don't think it's right to try to help transfer these patients, or we should be saying, we're willing to call a few places for you. And so that's what we've, we've ended up doing. And I think it can be, I've changed my view a little bit on this because I think while I feel very queasy about it, in cases where I think, um, somebody is affirmatively being harmed or cases that are sort of at, at a really crazy extreme, then I feel like it's one thing. But I think there is something to, um, even if it's we talk to four other hospitals and they decline the patient, there is something for families in this idea that we have reached out to other people. And I've been asked, um, you know, Jess McCannon, who now works at Mount Auburn, has asked me on occasion, could you come here and give another opinion because the patient's not safe to be transferred? And I think there is, and this we see this a lot at MGH, people want to get to MGH because they want the opinion at MGH. And I think I struggle with this when I'm doing outside hospital triage because I relate to that on the other hand, to accept these patients, there's an expectation that something will happen when they get here. And so what will happen, we see this all the time with people transfer for consideration of ECMO. They get here and we say, we can't put you on ECMO. And it's, it's like creating this whole additional layer of disappointment. Um, on the other hand, maybe it creates a reassurance that you know, a higher level, uh, you know, a, a more tertiary level hospital has said the same thing. But what I've seen many times, including with the patient who I talked about at the beginning of this, is that once people get here, there's a momentum towards doing things and then the things are done. And then these are cases that result in these prolonged disputes. So I feel like there's a pressure once people get here to do the surgery or to do the trach or to do whatever it was. And I have, there are numerous examples of that. So it's really tricky. But what I've said on our end is, in these cases, I think it's reasonable for us or for the medical team to reach out to a few hospitals and then they can say, you know, we've talked to these hospitals and everybody sort of agrees there's nothing more to offer. I think that can be helpful in some cases. In one case recently, um, we had um, somebody from the Brigham, the ICU director at the Brigham actually weigh in in a note sort of explaining um, that we, they would take them, but with the sort of the same parameters that we had put around care here. So. Um, uh, yeah, I think we're sort of leading towards more being supportive of those. I think we should be taking fewer patients from outside hospitals, though, who have these identifiable issues. Yeah. Wonderful. Maybe we'll open it up for one final yeah. question. Hi, thanks for the excellent talk. Sure. You, so you mentioned about the uh, culture and the religion. So I'm just wondering, there are some, again, like uh, some cultures, some religions where there's very little concept of kind of palliative care or like withdrawing the care. Um, and then I think like people die in the hospitals or like just really hard to say that okay you know take them home or whatever so again did you had any cases where you brought um, somebody like a mom or a chaplain and then they finally got into it and then finally the patient uh, the family agreed and then like did you have any success with those yes. or okay. yes we often we do that very very often and sort of early in cases where we become involved where we think that there's a trusted person whether it's a member of uh, you know of a particular you know, uh, religious faith, a chaplain, um, um, another trusted person, an outside, you know, physician who's been helpful. So, but we certainly engage um, chaplaincy frequently and often with very helpful effects in terms of bringing people to that, um, you know, to that point if they've, particularly if they've sort of cited um, religious um, object. One of the things that we were talking about just yesterday is this concept that people, um, 
providers, I think, often find it puzzling when patients are from countries that wouldn't have any of these resources, um, and the families are saying, we can't, we can't take things away, and everybody says, you wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't, if you were in, um, you know, such and such a country, this wouldn't have happened. But there's a way in which I think the fact that they don't have those things actually makes it um, more inconceivable that things will be taken away. And that's a very common theme, which I, under, I, under, I understand that. It's the concept of sort of taking things away is so completely foreign that it's just not in their realm of experience. And so you see that, and it feels very contradictory, but in reality, it actually seems psychologically, you know, understandable. Yeah. We'll end there. Thank you, Emmy. Oh, yeah. Thanks. <laughs>